Hello, everybody. This podcast is Lava. My name is James Wand. With me is Sam Shoemaker. Hey, everyone. And the beautiful Silas Whitlock. How's it going? Today's topic is about a famous gangster, or maybe lesser known, not quite as famous as Bonnie and Clyde, but he's up there. Yeah, he's, I'd say he's up there. John Dillinger. Oh, yeah. Silas is going to tell us a little story about his beginnings. Yeah, okay. So, originally, John was a boy who was born with no hands. You see, he lived as a beggar until one night, aliens presented him with restoration powder. He then grew hands and touched people's pock watches, pock watches, pock watches, <laughs> pock, pock <and> watches. <laughs> Restart. <clears throat> <laughs> I couldn't say pocket. <laughs> I kept. I wanted to go watch it. Pocket. <laughs> pocket watch it. Shut it, you pocket watch it. Stop watching it, you pocket. That was racist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like like it, it's like slang term for like Indian. Oh. <laughs> It makes it way worse. We're literally the same person because that's what I thought. <laughs> that's what I, I was thought in my head. I was okay, shut up. Start over. Tupac. Okay, so originally John was a boy who had no hands. He lived as a beggar until one night aliens presented him with hand restoration powder. He then grew hands and touched people's pocket watches until they felt uncomfortable and kindly asked him to stop, which he would then immediately strangle them out and say, I'm the best cook in America. Nobody can keep me from my rightful place upon the throne. That's about all I know about John Dillinger. So, Sam, take over from there. Is that true? Did that, that really is, happen? That is 100% accurate. You know, after your 300 hours of sleepless and uh, deliberate, delirious research. All in one week. All in one week. All I'm, in I'm one amazed. Week. I am amazed yeah. that that was the information you came up with. I but didn't, I, yeah. In reality, John Dillinger was America's, well, yes, America's and uh, the FBI's First, public enemy number one. Now, John Dillinger did not start out as a charismatic, gunslinging bank robber. Originally, he was born on June 22nd, 1903, in Indianapolis, Indiana. He was the younger of two children, born to John Wilson Dillinger and Mary Ellen Lancaster. Unfortunately, his mother died in 1907, just before his fourth birthday. His older sister, Audrey, cared for him and his brother for several years until their father remarried in 1912 to Elizabeth Fields. Now, John Dillinger, as a child, was a bit of a rambunctious teen. He was frequently getting into trouble in the town with the law for fighting and petty theft and was known for bullying and acting out. Which, if I'm honest, back in like what this would be like, the the teens of the nineteenth century like, or the twenty twentieth century. So I don't blame them for being bored. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, this was like people he, had hoops and this, sticks to play with. And this was like nineteen ten, nineteen twelve, and I can just imagine, you know, his dad probably worked, and it was basically just like be home by sundown, Johnny, and then he'd go out and like run yeah. in the streets, and you know, you get in all kinds of trouble. It was yeah, it was kind of cool because you know what, he just got days, he just got into nothing but trouble. Oh. Th- haven't even watched that movie, so can't even laugh at that joke. He quit school to work in an Indianapolis machine shop, and his father was fearful that the city was corrupting his son. Um, it did prompt the family to move to Mooresville, Indiana in 1921, but Dillinger's wild and rebellious behavior did not change, and his relationship with his father kind of deteriorated after that. Huh, weird. Uh, yeah, really, though. Um, he did enlist in the Navy shortly after that, and... He was a petty officer, third class, machinery repairman, and he was assigned aboard the battleship USS Utah. But he deserted a few months later, and that was when his ship was docked in Boston. Um, He was eventually dishonorably discharged. Now, all of this leads up to Dillinger's first crime. Or at least, as we know of the first crime. As we know the first crime. Well, he got into a lot of trouble, like as a kid, with like petty theft and stuff, but this is the first one... Where, you know, he's arrested and all that kind of bad stuff. This is the crime that put him in jail. Arrested and, and really, bad stuff. This is, yeah, this is the crime that put him in jail and really defined his, uh, his the whole beginning life. To his, the beginning to his, his life in yeah. organized crime. Yeah, um, yeah so John and a, his friend Ed Singleton. Um, that guy could never get a wife. N- nope, couldn't. Um, they came up, there was a... Obviously, a store clerk or a store owner inside An of elderly store clerk. Mm-hmm. Yes, <laughs> that's true. There's a store owner 
and they essentially set out to rob this guy from it after the store closed. So what they did is they had Ed parked a car inside of an alleyway nearby, and as he sat in the car waiting for John to take this bolt that was wrapped up in a cloth and come up behind the store owner and hit him over the head and rob him, it didn't go as planned, and essentially what happened was there's a struggle, John pulled a gun, fired off, but luckily no one was shot in that, but Ed freaked out, took off in the car without John, and John eventually overpowered the old guy, took the money from him, and then this actually really interesting thing about him, when he ran off, he ran to like a nearby par or, or bar or pub, my bad, <laughs> bar or pub, I forget what it was exactly, and he goes in there and he's like, guys, guys, did you hear what happened to, I forget what the story, I don't think they listed his name, but... <laughs> they he he tells him like something bad happened to him and do you guys know like what the status is on him and it essentially put him on the radar for the police to kind of hey, figure out. Hey, you know about like, this thing that nobody knows about? Yeah, exactly. He just like walks in and just like it's talks like, about it when nobody it happened seriously two minutes before he walked in the bar. So it's like when the newscasters accidentally said something about nine eleven before it happened. Ooh, yes, exactly. Like Government that. conspiracies. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> well, see. I I hadn't heard that part of it. Um, what I had here was that he, while he was leaving the scene, a local minister actually recognized the men um, and reported them to the police. Yeah. Okay. That is okay. also yeah. weird. So, that's, yeah. so that there's. I was so going to lead up to that. That goes together with that story. Yes. Then. Exactly. Um, and then, so the minister basically just rats them out, and they were arrested the next day. So. Yeah. Well, and here's the thing. So the the minister, I didn't know it was a minister. I just. Just right, somebody that it was local. an eyewitness. Yeah, yeah, that's all they listed him as. Um, they, so he's like, "Hey, it was the Dillinger kid that did it. You guys need to go and get him." And so they took the store owner there to the Dillinger uh, farm, and it was funny because the the store owner actually was like, "I don't think you were the one that did it. You weren't the guy that did this to me." And John just kind of like nervously sat there. He was like, uh, and they were about to leave. The police officers were about to take the guy and leave and go search someone, like check someone else out for it. But Dillinger actually felt super guilty and ended up confessing to it. And oh, that's interesting. Ratted himself. That. Yeah, he he actually ratted himself. He almost got away with it, but then he just felt guilty so about when it. When you rob someone, make sure to hit them so hard in the back of the head, not to kill them, but to jar jar their memory well, enough. It was it was just like. The, the store owner was like, I know you. I know you wouldn't do that to me. Like, you're so, a good guy. And before so, Before you rob somebody, be a really good, upstanding citizen and never do anything wrong until you rob them. Exactly. That's exactly. This is a podcast on how to do crime and how to rob people. You know, it's interesting because um, part of this was that when he did plead guilty, he pled that without a defense attorney. Yeah. Which screwed him over. Oh, yeah. Big time. Now- Never I had guilty. again. I had some different information, okay. um, which, with these things, you know, this is a this is a basically a folk legend. Like Dillinger has gone down in history as a bit of a Robin Hood character, especially back then mm -hmm. in the twenties and the thirties. Yeah. Oh yeah, he I mean, was, we're gonna he, get to it, but after his death, people were like, worship. Oh, they worship dude, worship was, him. Well, yeah, I got yeah no. We really crazy stuff. Yeah, don't yeah. yeah. We'll get we to, won't it, jump it, to it. We won't jump to that. It was just insane. Like I was listening to. It was, I just watched a video about it, and the guy was listing off stuff that people were doing, mm -hmm. and it's yep. like what it's in crazy. The world? Yeah. So, but what I had found here was just saying that um, someone actually convinced him to confess to the crime and plead guilty in the hopes of getting a, a lesser charge. Yeah, the police officers told him that he would have a better chance of getting a lesser charge if he pleaded guilty without the defense I attorney. See. Okay. So, it, so, so again, it, it is screwed correct. him over in the end. Yeah. It is correct. It's yeah. just you're adding to it bef some information that I didn't know and I didn't know if they conflicted. So, I just yeah, want no, to clear fine. that up cuz you know, there's a lot of elements to the story. Um, we are nothing but accurate on this podcast. Of course. Entirely. Take everything we have to say as the only truth, right, Sam? Exactly. That's true. Now, Dillinger was, of course, convicted of assault and battery with intent to rob and conspiracy to commit a felony. He expected a lenient probation sentence as a result of, you know, pleading guilty and everything. But instead, he was sentenced to 10 to 20 years in prison for his crime. As for Ed, who was just in the getaway car, he was only sentenced to about 2 to 14 years in yep. prison. And he was still single at that time. He was still single. And then, fun fact about Ed, um, he died August 10th, 19. 
37 because he drunkenly passed out on uh, railroad rails that's, and then got run over by a train. That's terrible. That's the fun fact for the day. Just want to point out. He did die alone. I feel like that. I feel like that's like a stereotype about the early 20th century, where it's like people just happen to fall asleep on railroad tracks. So basically, you're saying I just want to okay, Ed like is, you're drunk. Uh, he's Otis from uh, the Andy Griffith Show. I guess. Yeah, but you're st- you're you're drunk. His you're name? looking around. You go, hmm. This looks comfy. I mean, this is these, a nice bed. Yeah, what's that? This these is huge hard. iron tracks and these really bumpy rocks. Well, it's is probably that... similar to a mattress back then. They didn't exactly have memory foam. <laughs> is that is that my alarm? You mean they didn't have purple or <laughs> or the sleep number? Or, no, or sleep number or a Casper. Casper mattress. Please sponsor us, Casper mattress. No, they do sponsor. Us I mean, yeah, we're sponsored. Oh, totally. Sponsored. We Go actually do. Them. We actually do have a sponsor this week. Who's our sponsor? Our sponsor this week is Olivia Land Notebooks. You can find her on Etsy and get yourself a beautiful handmade notebook. Links are in the description. They're right beautiful. on. I have one myself. It's very nice. I do yes. not have one because I don't do art. They're but great. you don't need them for art. You can take notes. They're great for note taking. Um, they come in all sorts of varieties. They come with lined paper, uh, blank paper for notes. Um, a few of them had the dot grid, which is very nice for the artists out there. Um, so be sure to go pick yourself one up. Or playing that so game. Handmade. Each one or is individually You can play handmade. that game where you have to like create squares, and then when you create the a one square, of the most frustrating games that I play in church. You put your initials in it, and then <laughs> oh my gosh. and then you if you have more squares than the other players, you win. Yeah. Never understood. But back that to the game. drunk guy on the train tracks, you know, he's just laying there. He's going, ah, this is super comfy. Uh, this oh. is similar to my is, bed at home. Is that my alarm going off? I just hear a loud, loud wailing <laughs> thing. My cell phone does not sound like that. Is that is that my cell phone vibrating? Because the whole ground just seems like it's wow. <laughs> this Nokia is real good. <laughs> oh my gosh! Fun fact: His Nokia cell phone survived that. <laughs> <laughs> oh my. So yeah, that was the fun fact about Ed. Yeah. So. He grew up to be a drunkard. Not a not a great way to go out of this world. No, Definitely not really. Not. Um, Speak for yourself. Now, during okay. his, uh, he was actually going to testify against Singleton, and during the transport, Dillinger briefly escaped his captors, but was apprehended within a few minutes. And that's one of the cool BA things about Dillinger is he escaped a lot, not always I successfully. But I didn't know he escaped in that uh, like. He had, well, briefly, I mean, he br- oh, jumps out of the car door. He went crazy. to the bathroom, and they're like, oh, no, he's escaped. And they came back, he's like, what's going on? <laughs> they literally just look away from him. He's gone. Oh, no, he's still there. Okay. Wow, so the, 19, the 1920s cops sucked. <laughs> back like, then, the police department, some of them were were basically the Keystone cops. And so you just wonder, like, how did you, he was what? Were they the hot dog squad? <laughs> I don't know what that is. Oh. <gasps> I only know references from like the actual time frame that we're talking about. So the Keystone Cops were a silent film comedy group that were <laughs> rambunctious, silly cops. You run around, falling off their car. I was just going to describe them as a bunch of like Splinter Cell um, enemies, where they're like, "Oh my god, what? what? <laughs> <laughs> nope, nothing." Or obli- like, or Oblivion. Yeah, you're just like standing directly in front of them, and they don't see you. Basically, it was like. Um, Fallout when you had your stealth to 100 and you crouched behind somebody. <laughs> <laughs> you pickpocket all of them? Huh, must be the wind. Hey, what's must that? The- Why am I naked? Ah, oh, it's cold. Must be the <laughs> wind. <laughs> Anywho. So, but that's the thing. Like, okay, so like they may not have been, the, the police department may not have been that great right now, but like because of John Dillinger, we really have a better, we we got a better, um, we had better communication across uh, police departments and like the federal the, the FBI. Yeah. yeah, they learned so, a lot about how to look at crime scenes and to track a criminal. Yeah, which is really cool about this story is that it, it, he plays a big role in communication between just local police departments and federal level um, police, and, and it, yeah, it's cool. Yeah, I mean, to, to we're not being too hard on these guys either by calling them incompetent. No, they did everything they could. It's just... Well, no, I was saying we're not being too hard when we call them incompetent because... At one point, they do have a shootout with an empty house for six hours. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> well, not quite oh, empty. It was empty. Oh, that one. Never mind. Yeah, they're just like, eh, no, they're going to get away. Go, 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 Let's go, shoot go, go, it till it moves. <laughs> All right. So what's next? Yeah. So you know, jumping back to where we are in the timeline, um, he escaped from prison. 
No, he escaped from his captors en route and then was recaptured. Oh, in, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and that was en route to be testifying. Now, within the Indiana Reformatory and the Indiana, the Indiana State Prison from 1924 to 1933, Dillinger began to become embroiled in a criminal lifestyle. Now, I can only imagine prisons back then. Now, upon being admitted to the prison, he is quoted as saying, I will be the meanest bastard you ever saw when I get out of here. His physical examination upon being admitted to the prison showed that he had gonorrhea. Um, and the treatment at that time was extremely painful. Um, Did he kiss a koala? Probably. That's Wait, that's chlamydia. I was just going to say, dude, that's chlamydia. Wrong one. <laughs> Sorry. You guys bad. just have... And that would be getting a golden shower from a koala. <laughs> you guys have a really great, great knowledge of uh, STIs. You got to know about them, man. Yeah, that's true. I don't know why you got to know about them, but you got to know about them. Be informed. Be informed. Now, this and all the whole prison system and being admitted for a very long sentence, he became very embittered against society. And he befriended a lot of criminals while inside the criminal system, or I guess the prison system and, you know, with all the criminals. So among the bank robbers and criminals that he kind of uh, bumped shoulders with were Harry Pete Pierpont, Charles Mackley, Russell Lee Booby Clark, and Homer Von Meter, who taught Dillinger how to be a successful criminal. The men planned heists that they would commit as soon as they were released, and Dillinger... And Dillinger studied Herman Lamb's meticulous bank robbing system and used it extensively throughout his criminal career. So there's actually like a bank robbing system. <laughs> Apparently, there's there's probably a book that you can get in prison. <laughs> how, how to rob banks. In prison. It's like, <laughs> hey, hey, hang on. I got to get this my prison wallet. It's printed. <clears throat> All right, here's this book. Read it. After you get to prison, you can rob a bunch of banks. It's actually it's printed great. on uh, prison toilet paper, so you can use it afterwards. No, 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 oh you don't do that. You can't keep well, it. you have to hide it because you know you can't have that as evidence that you true, were a bank true. robber. So it's just like that's true. It's handwritten on like 150 sheets of toilet paper. How big are these sheets? Just one square. <laughs> There's not much to say about robbing a bank. Okay, walk so in like bank. you get some cool people it's and actually, then like well, no, you no, walk it's, into it's, bank. It's, it's actually a flip book. <laughs> <laughs> step one: get into a bank with gun. Step two: demand money. Step three: get away real fast. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, point gun at teller, intimidate teller, and then kiss grab teller. cash run, <laughs> kiss the teller. So Dillinger really did get all of his training when he was in prison. Now, would he have followed his life of crime I imagine outside him, like, of prison? I just want to imagine him in prison like, all right, so I'm the teller, come rob me. All right, awesome. Next step. <laughs> they're having, they're, having they're like, actually training in prison to rob banks. The, the and guard, like, hey, guards, can you be like the guards at the bank doors? The, well, the guards come by and they're just like, what are you guys doing here? And they're like, oh, we're, we're playing play, catching we're, robbers. We're playing, gonna, mon- we're playing Monopoly. I was saying we're, they're, they're reenacting a play. Like, oh, we're, we're doing a, a play called uh, Robbing the First Federal Bank of Omaha the day we get out of prison. <laughs> don't read too much into that title. <laughs> <laughs> think about it. Don't think about it. Think uh, about it. Don't think about it. Who wrote it? Uh, uh, Dillinger. <laughs> D- D- no, 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 no. Pierpoint. Pierpoint wrote it. Anyways. Let's face it. Now, yeah, this is basically the point in which his life is just set as a criminal. He's didn't not his, turning Didn't back. his wife leave him in prison? Um, or his girlfriend? I think no, that was no, he didn't have he didn't have a girl in prison just yet. Okay, that's nice. Yeah, that, no, that, this that is, is later. Is, that's later on. James, people didn't know he got married, man. Come on. You ruined it. You ruined it. Now, at this time, his father had actually launched a campaign to have him released because everyone kind of thought it was unfair that he got screwed over yeah. that way. And he was actually writing his dad, telling him about how he regretted doing what he did and how how he feels that prison is changing him as a man. Like, he, I guess there are letters that to his father about how prison is changing him as a man and he doesn't feel like he's going to be coming back the same. And like later on, there are more letters that he writes to his dad hmm. as he gets into another prison saying that, yeah, prison definitely made me the way i am today the reason why i'm living this life is because of prison Interesting. not saying that prison's bad or anything like that i mean it's not fun but but i mean, I mean back then for such a for i mean his crime was bad his crime was bad. his crime was bad yeah. but it was a pretty heavy blow to him especially when he was told like as a young uh, presumably he's a young kid kind of yeah. rash made a bad choice everybody loved him yeah, and, and everybody every- continues to love him all throughout his career. Right, even he's, as he robs people and yeah, he's a extremely charismatic character. Can't stress that enough. Back then, they didn't have a lot of comic books or anything like that. But if you could imagine, like 
following the adventures of Dick Tracy, following the adventures of Robin Hood, yeah. Batman, all of and those characters, that's him personified in quick well, little newsreels. He, here's, here's the thing, which I guess we can get into a little bit more later, but yeah. like, there, so the time when he was operating in the early 30s, there were a lot of movies out and there was a lot of like Hollywood glorification for... Um, the mobsters. For, yeah, mobsters, yeah. gangsters, stuff like that. So everybody saw what he was doing in the newspapers, and they were following him up and everything, and they were like in love with him because, you know, the way how gangsters and stuff were portrayed in films and whatnot. So so he was super popular and everything, and like being the cop wasn't necessarily the cool thing until like I think it was four or five years after you know, yeah, his yeah. time. They portrayed him as a bad guy, but like the good bad guy. Yeah, he's it was like, like he's like the the guy, the biker dude of today, like, but cooler. Yes, more class. It's hard to explain because have you ever seen White Collar? No. Yeah, that's exact. I would say he. White Collar is about a guy who steal who is a forager slash steals. He's art. a con artist. He's a con artist, mm. but he's awesome. And I've you heard like of him. I've heard of it, but I've never watched. First season is great. The other one's not so great, in my opinion. Uh, yeah. So yeah, his father actually did successfully get him paroled with that petition on May tenth, nineteen thirty-three. Yeah, this was after eight years of being in prison. Right. So he's had plenty of time to get screwed up. Yeah, and get learnt. Actually, yeah. So, um, unfortunately, on his way home from prison, his stepmother dies before he can even make it home to her. Like hours before he makes it home to her, I did she not dies. Know that. Yeah. Uh, wow. That. That messed with him too, for sure. I mean, if you imagine he yeah, got no. out of prison, you know, I mean, a month I'm, sooner, yeah. he'd have time with him. And her. he loved his family too. Yeah, he actually and got his along family really loved well. him. Yeah, he got along with his stepmother, which yeah. isn't always common. No. Um, give me a second here. I lost she let spot. him go to the ball and dance with the prince. Exactly. He got to wear the pretty dress. Now, this is all happening at the height of the Great Depression. Think about it, 1929 happens. The Stock market crashes. Now, he's an ex-con coming into a job market that's already sucky, and he has yeah. no prospects whatsoever. Mm-hmm. So, on June 21st, 1933, he robbed his first bank, taking $10,000 of the new Carlisle National Bank. On August 14th, Dillinger robbed a bank in Bluffton, Ohio. He was tracked by Dayton police, and he was captured and later, later transferred to the Allen County Jail in Lima to be indicted in connection to the Bluffton robbery. There's boom, boom, two robberies right out of prison. Exactly. Like, he's and ready to go back to prison. Just yeah. to put this, just to put this, like, $10,000 doesn't sound like a huge amount of money. But in 2017, that is $146,000. Yeah. It's a lot of cash. Or as they said back there, a lot of dough. A lot of dough. Mm-hmm. Now, let's go hang out with our dames. Yep, exactly. Now, when they searched him before letting him into the prison, the police discovered a document which appeared to be a prison escape plan. They demanded Dillinger to tell them what the document meant, but he refused because what was he going to do? Well, oh, yeah, heard... sure. I'm going to dig a hole through the and we're going to go out this street, go over the wall, and we can get out of there. We're free. <laughs> See, that's how we're going to do it. See? Step one, unlock door. How to do that? <laughs> Not sure yet. More of that later. <laughs> TBD. I heard <laughs> yeah, TBD. Um, I guess I'll just roll with it, you know? Anyway, I, I, the sources that I, I read up on were it was like they questioned, like, What's this document for, man? He was just like, I don't freaking know, man. I don't know. And they're like, <laughs> hmm, okay. And like, <laughs> didn't question it further. Uh, that seems reasonable. You probably just, you know, picked right. it up on the dirt street. They like pull it out of his pocket. What's that? He's like, I have no idea. I've never seen that in my entire life. They're like, <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm pretty sure like, that's what it's you. It's not mine. I believe. Pretty you. sure that's what you do with drugs if the cops ever find it on you. You just go, now, well, I've never seen that in my what? entire life. Drugs? No, I've never and then they have drugs. to believe it because they. They think you're on drugs, and your me- mind is only partially there. Anywho, I digress. Now, during this time, Dillinger was trying to conceive a plan for the escape of Pierpont Clark and uh, six others he had met while in prison, most of whom worked in the prison laundry. Uh, he had friends smuggle guns into their cells with which they escaped four days after Dillinger's capture over in Bluffton. Yeah, you. So they, they smuggled guns into into the laundry room with a crate that had a red X on it, and that's how they could determine which which one had the. 
Hey, what's this one? Oh, no, this one is ladies' slips. <laughs> Wait, and, what? Oh, what? This is a men's prison. This is supposed to be Tommy guns. <laughs> oh, well, they, like, overthrow the entire prison wearing bras. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. There's like, but oh, they, it was so a very progressive they, prison. Yeah. They... I'm pretty sure it was this prison. He broke out of so many prisons. He did. This and that's prison- where it gets so muddled. Like, I tried to track, like, who's in prison when because his gang will be in prison. Mm-hmm. And then he'll be in prison. And then he'll escape or they'll escape. And or they'll get him out or he'll... Get- yeah. It's yeah. like, so it's... So they get their guns smuggled into the to the washroom in this crate. And they break out of prison. Now, this is what was known as the first Dillinger gang. And it consisted of Pete Pierpont... Russell Clark, Charles Mackley, Ed Sprouse, Ed 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 Schaus, maybe I don't know. Schaus, I think it's Schaus. Okay, Ed Schaus, Harry Copland, and John Red Hamilton. I love their nicknames, as well yeah, as Mr. a member. Booby. Oh, he was a member of the Herman Lamb Gang, which was the the book or the the study guide of how to rob a bank that Dillinger was studying. Okay. Now Pierpont Clark and Mackley arrived in Lima on October twelfth where they impersonated Indiana State Police officers claiming that they had to extradite Dillinger to Indiana. Now, Silas has some good information on this. What I had heard in the documentary that I watched and on a couple of the articles that I had read, when he was arrested and brought into that jail, the police officer was, or the sheriff was asking him for, like, his name and stuff, and, and John gave him a fake name or and or at one point denied giving his, his name and wouldn't do it. And so he took his fingerprints and he sent them to the FBI. And the FBI sent him back and said, yep, he's a registered criminal. Like, you know, they find out. It was enough time for the police, the sheriff to go, I got this guy, here's his fingerprints, who is he? And the FBI is like, he's a match. He's uh, John Dillinger. And then, like, congratulations. And then, like, confirmation back. Like, I still got him, you know, kind of a thing. And in that meantime... Pierpoint and the and the rest of the gang showed up to that prison and were like, hey, we're here to pick up Dillinger. And the sheriff was like, actually, before I hand him over, like, what are your credentials? And they did a very, like, gangster move where they're like, oh, my credentials are right in here. Pop, pop, pop. And they shot him. Yep. And then they locked up his wife. You know, his wife was visiting the jail or something at the time. The sheriff's wife was. And so they take the keys. They unlock the jail cell. They do an exchange. They put Dillinger in the cell, or they take Dillinger out, Dillinger out of the cell and put the wife inside it and lock it. And at this point, the sheriff is still bleeding out, and so it was just that's just terrible. She, like she watched her husband bleed out, and she was like feet, like just a couple feet away from him, and as he bled out and died. That right is really sad. It is so a terrible thing. But then they got away, and they ran away to Indiana, and uh, that's where just more crime happened. Fun fact, we spent the weekend, or one day of the weekend, we spent Saturday down in Lima, and uh, while we were there, we visited a, a Cupid's restaurant, which was has been there for quite some time, and uh, it was just interesting, because you could kind of think, like, when I researched this, it was like, we were in the city that some of this stuff yeah, was happening. Yeah, super, like, I saw I saw news, news articles from the Toledo Blade about Dillinger being in the area, yeah. and how the local yeah. police are searching for him and stuff, I'm like, I can't imagine that happening, like, just being in small town right and, know, ba- and back then like i mean now when a criminal is on the loose i'm usually terrified because it's usually like some sort of mass murder yeah back then it was like oh robin hood is on the loose you're safe because you're just a commoner he's, yeah, he's robbing from the banks which were viewed especially during the great depression as like the bad guy they're the authority they're the bad guy so he's yeah. going around like hey sticking up the man you know yeah you're sticking up the man you commoners you're fine you know you're which, good which that makes sense why the public loved him so much yeah uh, apart yeah. from his his uh publicity that he got from the media and in the the stuff that that the news were telling saying about him um it makes sense why he was so loved by them Exactly, exactly. So it was cool to go down there and kind of just imagine. I don't know if QP's was quite around back then. Probably not. Probably not. I'm th- I'm guessing like 40s for them. Oh, wait. No, I think QP's at least. I, it's early 40s at the like at the latest yeah, that well, they opened. Yeah. They're, I know that QP's Pizza is like the oldest pizza restaurant in America. Oh, interesting. Something like that. Yeah. I can just imagine they break. They out. opened in 1936. Okay, I was Perfect. gonna say yeah in Finley, Ohio. Hmm. Okay, I can just imagine that they break out of jail, they get a little hungry, and they stop at one of those restaurants in Lima, and they're just eating burgers. Like, and then I'm the, sorry, I, I, this is off wiki. 
I know this matters. Founded in 1923. Okay. In okay. Flint, Michigan, under the QP Hotel Hamburgers. Okay. okay. That makes so, sense. So it kind of it, it branched out from there. But yeah. Yep. Their current headquarters is located in Lima, Ohio. Interesting. Anyways. So, yeah, you can just imagine they're stopping for burgers, and the waitress is like, oh, you guys look like you've seen, you know, had a rough day. Like, oh, you wouldn't believe it because we just broke she out of prison. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the big tip. Yeah, Here's a no, big tip. Here's $20,000 in the tip. That's another thing is they were very generous with their tips. Like, yes. They, like, yes. Which they, is, they, again, that's like their PR move. Yeah. They have the – they really do have the people's uh, love. Like, Yeah, they do. Who wouldn't? Well, you yeah. about if a you've ever, tip. If you've ever read The Grapes of Wrath, you would understand how terrible the Great Depression was. That's, that's just true. a small glimpse into it. Right. Now, that's more out yeah, west where it was... Yeah, it, it was way worse, but I'm just saying yeah. like that's a small glimpse into what some people were dealing with. Yeah. yeah. So, why he would be so sought after. He would, he would be such a figure in the community because... The banks were the bad guys. They were saying, "Oh, you haven't played. You haven't paid on your loan in a while. We get your land now." Yeah, yeah. and you can no well, longer I, feed your family. Even, well, even apart from that, though, just I saw some clips of Dillinger, like when he was arrested one of the times, and like he carried himself well, so like, like so well. So like, yeah, I could see how like people watching the news or seeing him on TV, watching that that arrest, just kind of like. He the way how he walked and the way how he was surrounded by people it look he looked like a celebrity. Yeah, and you can kind of imagine one that the people are rooting for him, so they actually kind of yeah they're like oh good he's caught, but also like oh he's caught yeah, and he's definitely the guy, he's the guy that all of the men wish that they that they could be him, and all of the women are just swooning over him. Yeah, like, he's got loads that, of babes. Yeah, he's got or that dames. Look. I'm sorry, dames. He's got the look, he's got the swagger, he dresses really nice, and he's got that charming smile that, like, you know, he just kind of yeah. has that. He is the model gangster. Yeah. Well, like, he was, I guess, uh, no, I need to, I'll, I'll talk about this when we actually get to that arrest. Okay. So we'll we'll jump back into what they're doing now. And now the gang's all back together. Yeah. And during this time, the Dillinger gang participated in... Roughly 12 separate bank robberies between June 21st, 1933, and June 30th of 1934. Um, at one point, they even pretended to be part of a film company that was scouting lo- locations for a quote-unquote bank robbery scene. That's interesting. I didn't know that. Bystanders stood by and smiled as a real robbery ensued, and Dillinger and friends rode off with the loot. That's amazing. Exactly. And so wow. stories like these only serve to increase Dillinger's legend. You can get away with anything if you have a camera. Exactly. So people are just like, oh, Or you could be incriminated for just about anything that, if you have a camera. That bank teller looks terribly frightened. That's so real. What a great actor. Wow, those guns. Like, I don't understand these effects, but when they fire those rounds in the ceiling, plaster actually falls. It's That's amazing. amazing. This is the best movie I've ever seen. It's so realistic. Can't wait to watch it. No CGI whatsoever. <laughs> None What? Yeah, no. Uh, that guy looks really dead. <laughs> I think I've seen that guy in the newspaper. Oh, he looks, yeah. That blood looks real. Now, in the midst of this crime spree, Dillinger was actually caught in Tuscan, Arizona on January 25th of 1934. He was imprisoned within the Crown Point Jail sometime after committing a robbery at a bank located in East Chicago. This is East Chicago, Indiana. In the middle of that crime spree between 1933 and 1934, Dillinger was caught in Tuscan, Arizona after committing a crime on January 15th in East Chicago, Indiana. Uh, the crime was robbing a bank with the gang, and it actually ended up with a dead officer, Officer Patrick O'Malley, and a wounded person shot in the hand, losing a finger, and shot four times in the groin. That's according to the uh john dillinger.com timeline wow so again 1930s medicine is not where it is today is anesthesia a thing yet yeah okay yeah. so it's a little better but it's still not pleasant though no in fact we'll For... get into anesthesia with john dillinger in a little bit he got shot in the groin sam <laughs> Multiple times. Well, I think he was also dead. So he no, probably... that's the guy that was wounded. Okay, so he survived. 
But he wanted to be dead. Officer O'Malley was killed, and uh, Hamilton was shot. Anyway, in so the that hand. was just uh, yeah, yeah. No, that that doesn't sound fun at all. But he was arrested on January 25th, so only 10 days later, in Arizona. And he was imprisoned within the Crown Point Jail. And uh, so the sheriff of that oversaw this prison was actually a woman. Her name was Lillian Holly, and she was boasting that uh, to the local newspapers that the jail was escape-proof and posted extra guards to make sure of that. Dude, I don't blame them for boasting about this. I saw actual footage of how many guards they had, you couldn't, like, if you gave each of those security guards a three-foot stick and told them to swing it around, holding the stick up, butt up against their chest and spin around in circles, they would hit each other. That's how many there were. They were, it was unnecessary how many people were in there. It was crazy, which was crazy. I saw actual footage of how many guards they had and it was it was seriously a bunch like it was unnecessarily abundant yeah yeah i believe it and you know of course he's this legendary character you you want he's known for escaping you want to make sure yeah like, no i mean i don't blame the the one frame he's that public i saw enemy number one the one That's frame right. the one little scene that i saw there was seriously 15 guards on like a 10 foot porch and like maybe five feet out from in front of the porch <laughs> there was a ton of guards and there's like you can't get past us yeah and they all had they all had guns and they were like just walking back and forth and, and everybody in this community was poor because they were taxing the living crap out of them to a fund this it yeah. just looked like god was like okay copy guard and then control v control v control v control v <laughs> and just like spammed a bunch of guards in there because <laughs> uh, they all look the it's same like, it's like when you're playing age of <laughs> age of empires and you're like all right so i need a bunch of these right here Click, 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 I've never click, played click, it, but I understand the concept. I, I've played it, so I get Halo you. Wars. I get you, James. Never played it, but you. I understand the concept. <gasps> I played that too, and I get uh, you, James. Uh, uh, Starcraft. It's an amazing Star game. Wars Galactic go. Battlegrounds. I don't know Kill why yourself, you're trying Sam. to tell me what the game is like. I, I told you I understand the concept. This is a side note, but nowadays, you know, police officers do have access to automatic rifles. Um, and generally they carry their shotguns and their handguns and everything. So they're well armed. Yeah. Back then these are just like, and the, but they're trained with them back yeah. then. It's like a couple guys and they're given Thompson machine guns. Yeah. No, I was reading up and there's like there one of the, one of the police stations that they actually robbed a couple of the, um, police officers pooled their money together to buy a Thompson to have at the, <laughs> Oh no! So and they, they stole it. So, yeah, and then then Dillinger in his game this came is and so stole. Sad, Alexa, it. Yeah. Play Despacito. Yeah, I think it was. I think it was the first prison. Or first prison. Oh my gosh! First police station that they robbed. And they that, went in. They yeah. stole like a a bulletproof vest. But we'll get into that later. One of the things that surprised police was actually that the Dillinger gang, when originally when they broke out, was that they instead of going and robbing banks, they robbed police stations. Yeah, which and so I they, think is super like it. it totally threw a curveball to them. Yeah. So they were robbing them and what they were getting were like Thompson machine guns and high tech 1911, you know, pistols, they got revolvers, they got shotguns. And what it did was essentially arm them better than most police departments. Yeah. They picked the the most well armed and then they'd go and rob those and then small town police shops or pol police shops, police, police departments shops. wouldn't really have. I mean, technically they were police shops too. I guess. Yeah, so, yeah. but they the, the Dillinger game. The small town places they wouldn't have the Thompsons and the shotguns and stuff. They have like pistols and whatever small arms they the had. Pickaxes and yeah, and hoes. You can actually imagine that they probably had like World War One rifles too. Like yeah, probably surplus rifles well, that they're and, like. This and they is were good probably actual like used in World War One oh, yeah. too. Probably. Yeah, and some of these guys are veterans for sure. Yeah. Anywho, back to the the jail. Right. So he's in jail. All these heavy guards, and uh, there's a lot of debate as to what happened on the day of Dillinger's escape from the escape-proof prison. This all happened on March 3rd. Now, Deputy Ernst Blunk claimed that Dillinger had escaped using a real pistol. FBI files indicate that Dillinger carved a fake pistol from a potato. Um, a potato? And then that's what people... That's what no, they what? said. No, I heard Sad it was from wood. a... Yeah, a wood... I've heard like, it from wood, too. A like a serving... Like a, 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 like, a, like a tray. Like a like wooden a serving tray. tray. Yeah. He had carved it out, and yeah, 
go ahead, continue. That I heard yeah. it was wood. And, and there was still others. Um, Sam Cahoon, for instance, the trustee that Dillinger first took hostage in the jail, um, he believed that Dillinger had carved the gun with a razor from some shelving in the cell. Okay, interesting. So there's a lot of debate as to what happened. And I've also colored heard... It, colored it with shoe polish. Right, colored it with shoe polish. But I've also heard yet another rumor that it maybe was smuggled in. Or maybe that... I heard about that too, which... What I heard was, so if you watch, which I encourage you guys to go and do your own research on this, but I came across more footage on John Dillinger when he's sitting there with his arm over the pros- his prosecutor's shoulder when he's first going into that that uh, prison, and he's holding his hand in the shape of a gun, and what people speculate and think is that alongside the smuggle the him smuggling a gun in. They think that that was a signal to his his gang that he needs them to smuggle a, a gun into him, mm. and he'll use that to get out. That could be. And and if you watch the footage, his hand is like that. Now I don't necessarily think that. Well, they they believe that it was to his gang and to other crime bosses, in that he's willing to pay any price for it. Well, it's also, that could be the equivalent of people saying that celebrities making the okay, okay sign with their hand is 666. Yeah, which, it, it's like... That's 100% true. New world learner, man. Of course. Okay, because why wouldn't you just stick your thumb up? Well, then, if you divide the number of fingers by, I don't know. Well, anyways... You multiply them by thumb. This did lead to his escape. Mm-hmm. Um, Do you know how, like, the process that took place and then they don't i don't have that written down you don't have it written down no go for it um so essentially what happens or what i had heard was that he took this fake gun we're just just for the sake of this one individual story i'm just gonna say that's the most commonly accepted i mean you go to the you go to the prison museum and it they've got a wooden gun there so he takes his fake gun and he somehow he gets a, a guard to come to his cell which he then it's dark it's like very dimly lit he points the fake gun at him and in the the guard can't tell if it's real or not so he gets the guard to unlock the uh, the jail cell door and one by one he has the prison guard call in other prison guards and lock them into individual cells and he he essentially locked up 18 guards what oh my i heard goodness. <laughs> i did not hear that just That's by awesome. holding this one guard hostage with a fake gun and then you put him in a prison cell and locked him up too, and then walked out the front door. Deception level yeah. one hundred. He walked out the front door, went That's to, the, like 1, 000, went to the garage, and stole the sheriff's uh, car, yes. which was a huge deal. Yes, because she was the one who was really promoting. Yeah, it was kind Our of like jail is unescapable. Yeah, and and so he steals her car, and so it's just kind of like a hey, gotcha kind of a thing. Which just leads up into how the FBI really got involved. This is the first time that he... This was one of his biggest mistakes. One of his biggest mistakes. He crosses the Indiana State-Illinois border, and that's when it became... If This is the first time he cre- uh, committed a federal crime. Because you're transferring stolen goods from one state to another. Yes. And this is when the FBI could finally get involved. They're just waiting. They're like they're all in there. <laughs> they're all inside the car with them. <laughs> they're not quite. But they're they're all in gotcha. there. They're all in their own 1930s helicopters, and <laughs> just following. Them. Well, they, they actually had like days. way better technology than we do even now. So yeah, that's true. Totally. So essentially, why the FBI was so eager to jump in onto this case and and get involved in it is because throughout all of Dillinger's robberies. J. Edgar Hoover was working on on bringing in like in b- beginning new protocols and and uh, new ways for the FBI to operate more with local police, and so that's why he they were able to jump on this so quickly, and that's why they were so ready to jump on it because it was finally a reason for them to get involved. Yep, and they he, were they were watching him beforehand, yes, and they wanted to yes. get involved, but they couldn't because of laws. So basically, as soon as that happens, J. Edgar Hoover creates a special task force to be headquartered in Chicago to locate Dillinger. Yeah. They are on the ball. They're just like, oh, hey, look. Boom. You you done goofed. Yeah, exactly. Now. You done goofed. You done goofed. I can just. 
1920s, or 1930s. <laughs> oh, you done goofed. Yeah, they all talk like that super high pitch. Yeah, oh, you done goofed. Yeah, you done goofed there, mate. You done goofed. We're gonna. <laughs> you done goofed. I'm gonna so go they home. become Irish. I'm gonna go home with my dame, with all my dough. Now it was actually after his escape, even with all the surveillance going on, that he went back and visited his family home and had a very sweet little picnic with them. Um, that's a very brief little snippet of his story, but he still cared about his family at that point. Goes back, has a great little time with his dad, and uh, the police come and interview him after, like, because then they're like, "Oh no, he's there," and they they catch up to him, and he's like, "Oh well, you know, he stopped by and had dinner, and he left." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, no. So okay, what I what I had read was that the the FBI followed him to that house, and he he was with his woman at the time. Evelyn Frenchette, I think, is her name. I believe that's pretty close. Okay, <laughs> I'm not. I, I can't. I'm terrible at pronouncing these. So he took her there and was like showing, showing him off her him showing her off to the family. Like, yeah, hey, I'm gonna marry this woman someday. Blah 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 blah. And they kind of had like a small like family reunion, like you know their immediate family, like nephews and stuff were there, and and they fa- figured out that they were being watched by the FBI. They were just like outside in cars. I don't know where, like the tree line or something like that. And the way how John and Evelyn got away was the family. Oh, and here's another thing. He was showing them the wooden gun that he, he's like, this is how I got out of prison. Like, this is how I broke out and like gave him the gun as a souvenir. That's how we have the gun is. Yeah. There is a picture of him holding. holding yeah, the gun. Yep. yeah. 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 And, I remember seeing that in the documentary that I watched, which is unfortunately different than the one you watched. So. Yes, unfortunately. We need to share sources more. Yes. <laughs> so so what happens was they, John's nephew kind of like hides his face and goes and gets in the car and drives off in the car. And the FBI agents like follow that car and pull him over. And while that's going on, John and Evelyn sneak out the back and get in a different car and go in the other way. And like, oh, bamboozled him again, kind of a thing. And then the FBI is like, well, we can't do anything with the family. And so they kind of just got away with it. And essentially, yeah, it is crazy. They just like diversion. Like a couple of magicians. Oop, stole your kidneys. Now, we're not going to be able to cover all of the events um, leading up to the end of a legend. Um, There's a lot of little shootouts and robberies and heists and crazy shenanigans that Dillinger gets up to. But we'll try and cover uh, some of the the highlights, I suppose. Yeah. What we recommend is that if you find this subject interesting, go research into it more. We've We've got a lot of the bigger events covered now. Yeah. But obviously, there's a lot of skepticism behind some of the events. And so if you just want to go find your own opinion on it, go do it. There's a couple great documentaries on YouTube that are under an hour that you can watch. Mm-hmm. Um, and so hopefully we kind of spark some interest in yeah. this character of yeah. John Dillinger. And there's so much more to him that can be delved into, but it's just not in an hour format. You can't do it in an hour podcast. Now, one of the really interesting things, and I'll just briefly go over this, was that he actually went to a plastic surgeon him and a couple other guys went there and 1930s right so this surgeon can't be the best but but dang they did a great job yes they did i don't want to know the amount of pain he was in a lot from (laughs) what i heard he ended up having uh two moles or warts removed on his right lower forehead between his eyes and one uh at the uh, outer angle of his left eye Mm-hmm. Um, he they, wanted a depression in his nose filled, a scar removed. Um, what do they do? Just get drywall putty? <laughs> it's the 1930s. Get some spackle. Do? Just like cut a little nick just, in his nose and then just stub some drywall. I was just say they took a needle and doop, and then just blew in on the other and filled <laughs> it up. He also wanted his dimples removed and he wanted the angle of the of his mouth drawn up. Um, and this was all from the same guy and it was all done under general anesthe- general anesthesia. Now, he also he also got his nose like evened out a little bit. Too. Yes, like, yeah. If you see before pictures and after pictures of the of the surgery, he has like a very. It's like if you could make a small little skateboarder guy, it's like a little half pipe that you could do <laughs> on his nose. It's like the perfect little ramp. All of this was to just kind of 
change his appearance, blend in a little bit more, and remove those identifying features that would really give him away. Yeah. Um, Make him look like Joe And it did work. It did work because it removed the ability for... It it removed the confidence in the FBI's knowledge of his appearance. What's crazy is that you were talking about how good the... uh, the pain and how the plastic surgery probably went. At one point, uh, he was administered an overdose, an overdose of ether, and it caused Dylan Drew to suffocate. So he was beginning to turn blue and basically die. And the doctor had to pull out his tongue with a pair of forceps to keep him from choking on it, and shove his elbows into his rib cage in order to get him breathing again. I don't fully understand how that That's works. That's crazy. Um, but Dillinger gasped and re- resumed breathing, so he, he survived. You can't kill gangsters. That was that was only the first string of plastic surgery that he had. That was the most extensive. Oh, he had more than but one. But then, yes, he had more I didn't than know one. He had more than one. He and I believe at least one other member of his gang on June third of nineteen thirty four went and had their fingerprints removed. Oh, okay. Yeah, I did. Yes. I thought. The, so, and, how do you remove your fingerprints? Painfully. Now this Very was painfully. done at five hundred dollars. Don't you pick him a bunch? This was done at five hundred dollars per hand, so it's a hundred dollars a finger. Holy crap! To, but these guys are loaded. That's true. Yeah, I mean they've got one of their heists. One of the recent heists, they got seventy five thousand dollars of yesteryear money, which yeah. is a lot um, of today money. Yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. I mean, you could do the math, but it's a lot of money. Yeah. Um. So yeah, like that. That is really what he was learning from what he knew of the crime investigation process and he was trying to outwit them now there was another event that took place where he was actually in a lodge and it ended up getting surrounded this was kind of one of the moments where there was a bit of police negligence yeah uh they surround him and basically initiate a armed standoff um but amazingly dillinger i think i believe if I understood the uh, order of events correctly, a gunfight ensues where all of these policemen are just shelling the house with everything they have. What? Go yeah. If you got the, okay, so this is about the lodge in is it Minnesota? I believe so. So at that lodge, the it was so cold at this point at this time of year that the agents that were coming up on the house, one of their cars actually died while driving up to it because it was so cold. And so they had the agents from those cars that died hop on the other cars that were still running and just hop up on the sides of it and, like, turn their lights off, and they drove about two miles in to the lodge. And they parked, and they waited. And upon arriving at the lodge, a couple dogs barked, and some people came out of the front door and got, went to hop in a car. Oh, and that's right. And the police right. freaked out. That's right. And, and these were just they, innocent people. Yeah, they opened fire, killed two innocent people, and injured one guy. That's, in, in this gunfight, yes. And while that happened, as the all the gangsters, they, they had the right lodge. Mm-hmm. All the gangsters were just upstairs hanging out, having a good time, and all of a sudden, this gunfire just ensues upon the lodge in this car that's outside the lodge. And you're they, right, and they that's how they escaped. Back. Yeah, that's because how they, they were alerted that these innocent people, unfortunately, were hurt and killed. Yeah. Um, and they're like, "Oh, look, we're busted. Let's get out of Dodge." Which, uh, Henry Pierpoint was one of the gangsters that was with him at the time and he actually was confronted by two FBI agents which he killed and made hit the later on when he gets sent to the to the uh, electrical chair mm-hmm. that's electric chair not electrical chair to the electric <laughs> I'm chair imagine that being a dance the, the electrical, electrical chair. chair oh uh after he was like that event, him killing those two FBI agents, that's what sent him to the electric chair. Gotcha, gotcha. Him and one other dude, but that that was the the time they confirmed that that mm-hmm. he killed two agents. So it was after this, and that that was what gave the um, the task force manager the personal vendetta against him. Yeah. Yes, yeah. And there is also one I don't remember his first name, but Leach. There is a there's a specific specific detective that would follow like was on Dillinger's trail and was always just like a step behind him, and which at is one such point, a movie moment. Oh, it is. It really is. And at one point, Pierpoint and I don't remember when this is, so I'm sorry that this is kind of just out of nowhere. I apologize, but I could, I don't remember fact. where it's at. It's just a fun fact. 
Dillinger would write the guy postcards telling him, hey, I was here. <laughs> and oh, at one point, my goodness. Dillinger and Pierpoint are walking downtown. I forget what town it was. They're walking downtown, and they see Leech, and they follow him <laughs> for like a couple blocks. And then they go to hop on like a bus or get a taxi. And right before they get in, they're like, hey, Leech, how's it going? Any news on Dillinger yet? And he turns around and sees him, and he's like, can you just imagine the amount of... Like, they're just toying with the poor guy. Yeah, yeah. That guy goes home and doesn't sleep. He yeah. just stares. He has, like, a wall that's plastered <laughs> with Dillinger's face, and he just shoots it at night. Every <laughs> single night. Kush, I'm going to find you, Dillinger. Kush, I'm going to get you. Kush. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so... But in this Lodge event, going back to that really quick, all the gangsters basically escape from it, and the police just shoot the lodge. Yeah. For six hours. Yeah. And then when they finally, I think Dawn, this is all at night, so they don't know if anyone's shooting back. They're just shooting the lodge. And uh, the next day, when Dawn breaks, and- uh, Because they, they didn't have flashlights or right. candlelights or anything. This was before just, just modern Just gun flashes light. and- Just gun flashes Tommy and- guns. and and angry screams. And headlights. They probably had their headlights. Yes. But they realize that they have just given the criminals a six-hour head start. <laughs> yes. By wasting a lot of ammunition <laughs> on a building. Yeah. Um, and all of this kind of peters out, uh, or I, I guess all of this leads up to the end of Dillinger's reign as the legendary criminal that he was. Um. Now, during this timeline of events, um, the woman that he brought to visit his family is actually captured by, yeah, and Evelyn imprisoned. Yeah, Evelyn Freshat or whatever her name is. I can't yeah, pronounce her Evelyn, last name. Yeah, Evelyn is unfortunately in prison. And this is actually really heartbreaking for Dillinger. Despite all of his criminal acts and his robberies, I believe he's only accounted one official murder, but there could have been others that yeah. he did. Um, despite all of this potentially cold, hard behavior, he was very broken hearted over the fact that he was not going to see her. Uh, and he did in fact never see her again after she had yeah, been captured. Yeah. And Which was arrested. is hard for her too. You know? Yeah. Um, so in that time he comes into the company of a prostitute uh, by the name of Rita Hamilton. She was a runaway and uh, she worked for Ana Cumpanos. I, I d probably am butchering that name, but Ana Cumpanos was a madame from a brothel in Gary, Indiana, and she is later known as the woman in red, according to FBI yes. files. Uh, she was a Romanian immigrant, and she was being threatened with deportation mm -hmm. um, for low moral character. Yes. Uh, I wonder why. Hmm. She still gets deported. <laughs> yeah. Now, what she, great work. Now she realized that Dillinger Clank. was frequenting her brothel and yeah. visiting Rita a lot. Huh, weird. So she tries on July twenty first to broker a deal with the FBI. She's going to provide information on Dillinger that could lead to his capture in exchange for help in preventing her deportation. Well, she had also built up just like a friend, kind of like a small friendship with Dillinger over the time. Mm. See, I did and not so know it that. Was, it was, she knew that he was kind of in love with this prostitute and visiting her, and she would actually spend time with both of them, like at his apartment and stuff like that. And on the twenty second, she find or on the twenty first, she, they are like, hey, tomorrow let's go see a movie. Yep. And so yep. that's what's leading into this, and that's how she gets information to the FBI. That's right. Is yeah. like, hey, if you don't deport me. I'll give you information on Dillinger. Which is a sucky thing to do. Yeah. That's a sucky thing to do. But at the same time, Dillinger was also kind of a sucky guy. Right. And she's also not exactly in the most uh, no, trustworthy <laughs> business. It's just terrible people all around. Yeah. I mean, you're a criminal in a criminal world. So yeah. I guess it's all fair in love and war. Uh, so yep. July 22nd, this is the day that uh, Dillinger and Rita Hamilton decide to go see a movie at the Biograph Theater. It was a showing of Manhattan Melodrama starring Clark Gable and uh, Myrna Loy, as well as William Powell. It's actually a crime drama. Yeah, and it's actually a good movie. I've seen that movie. I have not seen it's it. It's a good movie. But I saw a trailer for it, and it looked really intriguing. It is pretty good. Which 
I guess it's just kind of ironic to me. There's a crime guy going and watching this crime drama about agents trying to track D- down. Quick, the funny thing. I'm going to start calling all bad guys crime guys. Crime guys. <laughs> hey, Ooh, hey, look out for so that. mysterious. What that? It's crime like guy. Like all serial killers? Well, oh, this, oh, well, this no, is a real bad crime guy. It's serial it's, crime guys. I'd say <laughs> they're only crime guys if they wear ties, like trench coats and fedoras. So like they're classy crime guys. Yeah, crime guys are like... They're kind of they're they're like definitely gangsters, but then there's bad guys and they're just the pieces of crap that work for the gangsters. Yeah, exactly. They work for they're the crime the, guys. They're the bad guys. No, funny thing about that is, yeah, he he, so he is this he is this gangster watching this movie glorifying gangsters, and at the end of it, the, his last words, last recorded words, were, were not recorded, but remembered words were. Wasn't that a great movie? <laughs> of course. Yeah. Which, yeah, I'll have to watch it now. I want to see if it is a great movie. I liked it. I can immortalize Dillinger's words as to say, that, that was, was a, a great movie. movie. Yep. So, the movie ends on July 22nd, as I probably already said, and just wanted to reiterate that in mm-hmm. case you didn't which, know. Which, fun fact, that was one month after his 31st birthday. Yes. In which, on that very, on his birthday is the very day that he was announced to the public as enemy number one. Public oh, enemy yeah. number one. And he took that title with pride. So not only did he celebrate his birthday, he also celebrated receiving that title. <laughs> Thank you very much for this wonderful award. Yeah, no, this is an award. A, yeah, this, it, no, it was this, a very prideful thing for him. You're, you're a bad... No, this is, this is a great He's day. He's like, this thing is a great you. thing for me. Yeah. Thank you, man. So Thank awesome. And just want to say thank back you. Back to yeah. the present or... Cutting back to the night of July 22nd. Now, Dillinger walks out of the theater, and an agent standing by the door signals his exit by lighting a cigar. Both he and other agents reported that Dillinger turned his head and looked directly at this agent as he walked by, glanced across the street, then moved ahead of his female companions and reached into his pocket, but failed to extract a gun. He then ran to a nearby alley. Other accounts stated that Dillinger ignored a command to surrender, whipped out his gun, then headed for the alley. So... Even in a crowded street, there's a lot of different stories going on here. Yeah. A lot of different eyewitnesses reporting different things. Agents had already closed off the alley, but Dillinger was determined to shoot it out. Um, he was pursued and fired. Clarence Hurt shot twice, Charles Winstead three times, and Herman Hollis once. Dillinger was hit from behind and fell face first to the ground. He was struck four times with two bullets grazing him and one causing a superficial wound to the right side. The fatal bullet entered through the back of his neck, severed the spinal cord, passed into his brain, oh, and man. exited just under the right eye. Oh, I did not know that. It's yeah. crazy. Severing two sets of veins and arteries. An ambulance was summoned, although it was soon apparent Dillinger had died from the gunshot wounds. He was officially pronounced dead at Alexian Brothers Hospital, and according to investigators, Dillinger died without saying a word. I'm pretty sure he died as soon as those bullets passed through his head. I yeah, don't think. It, yeah, there probably wasn't much opportunity. The 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 people like <laughs> the coroner gets there like barely steps out of the ambulance. They're like, yep, he's dead. <laughs> I mean, really, you don't survive a shot. He to the gets head up and runs away. Oh, bamboozled <laughs> again. <laughs> he's like, it's all ketchup. <laughs> you missed. I, I put ketchup in my eye. <laughs> You're firing blanks, suckers. My plastic surgery stuff was bulletproof. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, no my just... plastic surgery stuff exploded. <laughs> well, I was going to say, his plastic surgery was putting tubes in his body that if he was shot, the bullet just travels through the tube and Travel leaves without tube. injuring yeah. anything. That'd be a great Whoop. idea. As long as you hit the tube, yeah, you got to be. So it's just chance. <laughs> you have magnets all around the tube, so that it just draws. <laughs> or you know, you could do that's a lot easier and magnetic. a lot less painful. Definitely. <laughs> you, you know, it's a lot less painful. You, you get really good at dodgeball. That's what you do. You don't get done shot. That too. You wear a bulletproof vest. He had a lot of those from the police places uh that he robbed the police station i guess it doesn't right. help you get really, shot in the head but <laughs> no well the yeah. back of the neck up through yeah you wear yeah. the vest wrapped around your head <laughs> <laughs> you cut two little holes in it now i'm sure bulletproof vests back then were probably about as good as his plastic surgery like well, bulletproof pl- vests back then is like they just had a steel plate or whatever so you get shot more than a couple times with it the steel plate's integrity is just gone is just gone and you can get killed through it like oh, you get absolutely. shot you get shot six times and you have a higher chance of actually dying. It's like it. they took two cast iron plates or like pots and pans and mm-hmm. just like 
wrapped them in cloth and tied them around your neck. You're like, now you're bulletproof. Go, yeah. Superman. Be the voice of freedom. Exactly. <laughs> I can go fly, swimming. Right? No, that was only for bullets, you idiot. You're dead now. Oh. So he's laying there dead, or whatever. They pick up the body. They they take it to the well, morgue. Well, right? yes. I was going to say, just interestingly enough, there were actually were a couple bystanders um, who were wounded. Um, oh, they were? I didn't know that. Yeah, just from the shootout. Okay. Uh, it seems that there were two female bystanders, Teresa Paulus and Etta Natalski. Well, they just got to get out of the way. Clearly. If they see a bunch of guys running around with guns, they got to hide. That's just the way how it's supposed to work. Stupid. Common sense. Come on. It's not like everybody had guns back then and... <laughs> And Most it, likely was chasing each other with <laughs> guns, too. Of course. It's it like was, Yosemite Sam <laughs> everywhere. It was thought that Winstead was uh, the one who fired the fatal shot, and as a consequence received a personal letter of commendation from J. Edgar Hoover himself. According to the New York Times, later that day they reported that Dillinger was shot and killed by special agents on July 22, 1934, at approximately 10.40 p.m. Dillinger's death came only two months after the deaths of fellow notorious criminals Boone, Bonnie and Clyde. I was going to say Booney and Clyde. Bonnie, Bonnie and Clyde. And Clyde. <laughs> Bonnie and Clyde. Um, there were reports of people dipping their handkerchiefs and skirts into the pools of blood that laid yeah. on the concrete. Yeah, there's there's one account. So the photographer that came to take pictures of the crime scene mm -hmm. re remembers one dude coming up dropping his handkerchief in the in the blood, picking it back up and going, look, honey, the kids are going to love this someday. That's mind-blowing. Yeah, like, because he was so, and it's not because it was like, oh, you know, I witnessed this. It was because it was John Dillinger. He, yeah, and he they was had just to that fight, character. They had to fight off scavengers. There were people that were said to have even dipped newspaper into it. Yeah. They didn't have a handkerchief, so they're just like, oh, newspaper will newspaper, work. Newspaper, yeah. I would love to know if any of these are still around because presumably there had to have been dozens, at the very least, yeah, dozens of people doing there's this. There's a lot of, I mean, if people were dipping skirts in newspapers and handkerchiefs, like, yeah, there's got to be yeah. quite and, a bit. And they did this intentionally, so this would have been preserved. Yeah. Now, oh, yeah. you have to imagine somewhere in somebody's attic there's a box with maybe a note tied to it that says, handkerchief dipped in Dillinger's blood. That would be amazing to find. Like, that would be something. It would be amazing to find, but that's also probably something where it's like, nowadays, who knows who John Dillinger is? Yeah. Other than people that purposefully research this stuff. Because I love that time period, like the early 1900s up through the middle of the 1900s, I would love to have a framed handkerchief of Don, John Dillinger's blood. That sounds super creepy you mean to like say. This? <laughs> yes, exactly like that. James is showing off a picture of one of the handkerchiefs that was preserved. Yeah, Blood of the bandit, John Dillinger killed, July, 22, July 22nd, 1934. Let me see that. I want to see the picture. Now, so after going to the morgue and everything, uh, Dillinger's body was available for public display at the Cook County Morgue. An estimated 15,000 people viewed what the corpse the over a day and a half. As many as four death masks were made. Um... Now, Dillinger's body is currently laid to rest in the Crown Hill Cemetery in Indianapolis. And there was one police officer who was so happy he was dead, he actually shook the corpse's hand. That's weird. That's super weird. I didn't know that. That's great. So, the, you know, creepy little moment. I was watching one of the, the shots that they took on the old uh, janky film cameras, you know? Yeah. And there's a, a shot of Dillinger with the uh, uh, blanket over him. And it's more or less a close up of this, like a profile of his head. And as it's filming, you see a trickle of blood start to come out of, just slowly ooze out of the bullet hole in the side of his face, under his That's eyeball. That's so crazy. So gross. Oh my gosh. So gross. And uh, one fun little fact uh, to end this off Dillinger's gravestone has actually been replaced several times because people chip off pieces for souvenirs. Yeah. And actually, another thing is his father was so worried that they were going to steal his body, they had three foot of concrete poured on it. I knew about the three the three foot of concrete. I didn't know the reasons why. That's but that crazy. makes a lot of that sense. That makes a whole lot yeah, of sense. Yeah, his dad was worried that people would come dig up his body. Which is that's, completely fair. That's something like from the old days. Like, oh, yeah. Like people, Shakespeare's head is still missing kind of thing. And did you know that yeah. uh, people also offered... Uh, Mr. Dillinger, ten thousand dollars for his son's body. That, you know that that's crazy. You know that he he lived a wild life. He ran fast and hard. 
Ran fast, shot fast. Got the dames? Got, got many at dames. Least, yeah, you at know, least two. Well, they probably just don't cover all the brothels he went to. I, I'm yeah, sorry to leave this for yeah. last, but I do want to just put this little fact in here because this was really part of what... There was a scene I watched on YouTube, uh, the Johnny Depp character in Public Enemy, the movie Public Enemy. Which I want to watch that movie now. I do. I don't think it's historically accurate, but it kind of captures some of his persona. Yeah. There was a lot of people that said that in addition to his smooth mannerisms, his cool talking, his polite attitude, there were two things, his polite attitude towards bank tellers and the way he could so smoothly vault over um, walls and counters. He yeah. was known for being very light on his feet and being able to just lightly like bounce over walls yeah. which and are, was always extremely polite. Which didn't some of his gang members call him Jack Rabbit? I didn't hear that, Spring but Spring Hill it could Jack? Be. It really could be. And that's just one of those things that adds to the legend of John Dillinger and why people idolize that man as the Robin Hood of the 1920s and 30s. Well, thank you guys so much for doing all that research. I think it was very well done. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Be sure to check us out on Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, Podbean, and Instagram. This podcast is Lava. In MySpace. Yes, MySpace. Bye. (laughs) Sam, kiss to the mic. Be sure to come back next time and enjoy more of these smooth voice tunes.